This is handling structural failures while squares break down. Yeah. Today is Tuesday, April 11th at the Caller Lab Convention. It's 10.30 something a.m. because we were too respectful to, to evict the legends. We may be legends in progress, but we're not them. Good morning. My name is Eric Hennerlaw, and uh, my colleague today is Betsy Gatta. We thank you all for attending. Today's session is called Handling Structural Failures, Why Squares Break Down. And before we start, is there any part of the back door that can be closed or, or mitigated or... All right, all set there. Great. Thank you all for coming today. Um, what we're going to talk about here is um, what we're going to talk about from a couple of different angles. Um, we're going to talk about when you're calling and you have squares out there and you're calling to them and you find out as the process of your sequence that the squares are falling apart and breaking down. And so the question becomes, uh, what causes that to happen and what can you do about it? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. and 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 typically, I want to start with a, the with a presumption that when we call, we want dancers to be successful. That we actually will, when we call something, we want actually we actually want dancers to do that call and be successful and get through it. Um, and I, I believe that's the case in 99% of the cases. And only rarely do we actually want to kill the dancers. I hope not all the time. But so what we want to do is we want to call in a way that the dancers actually are successful. They get through the sequence, and when they don't get through the sequence, the question is what happened? What what happened to the dancers, what happened to us in the calling, and what's what's our what's our whole step in this? Okay, all right. Thank you. So I want to look at the reasons why the squares break down, what our role in the breakdown is, and what steps we can do to prevent the breakdowns. So it's kind of a three part here. And so a lot of this will be common sense information that a lot of you may know already, but it's always good to write down what is obvious because then you can kind of think about what, what what's out there. Okay, so why do squares break down? We know that when we call and squares break down out there, uh, there are several reasons why squares can break down, but I kind of divide them into two categories, um, hall issues and dancer skill issues. Now, I'm not saying dancer caller issues, and I'll come back to that in a second, but they're hall issues and dancer skill issues. Okay, with regards to hall issues, there are usually three areas where, where hall issues can play a role in a breakdown for a square. Okay, what could they be? Well, we can talk about the surface, where you're, what you're dancing on, right? You could have a floor that's too slick or too rough, and that causes dancers not to be able to move correctly to get through the sequences, right? Um, or the floor could be too crowded. You could have too many dancers out there and just, just can't move fast enough to get through all that stuff. Uh, or the dancers can't hear, right? So there you go. Uh, so the first two problems are usually out of your control. You usually can't do much about whether the floor is too crowded or whether the floor is uh, too slippery or too rough to dance on. You can't do much about that. Um, but if the dancers can't hear, you can do something about that. And that's a very important part of this. So when you, when you get to the part where the, you're calling in a hall and the dancers can't hear you, and you know you always hear that. Some dance, some dancer is going to come up to you and say, I can't hear you, I can't understand you, you know, bring the music down, I can't hear your voice, bring your voice up, whatever it might be, you do have control over that. And actually, if you think about it, we don't think about it, but really the sound systems we use today are really remarkable in the sense of what they allow us to do with mixing. We have complete control over the tone that goes out, we have complete control over the music and, and microphone mixing, so that we have at our fingertips the way to control the sound that goes out there. Even in a hall with really bad acoustics, and we've all called in halls that have really bad acoustics, we still have control over the sound system in such a way that we can make ourselves known and heard as best as possible. And what happens is you'll have to, when you have bad sound areas, what will have to happen is you'll have to play with that adjustment of the mix and the music 
and the voice in such a way that the music keeps coming down and down and down. Maybe the voice goes up somewhat so that ultimately the dancers will hear and understand you, even if it's to the point where the music almost goes away, which uh, I think we talked about that earlier, right? So, so it's, it's, it's one of those things, never ideal, but, but you do have control over those situations. Um, another reason that dancers can break down is due to a mismatch between their skills and what the caller is calling, assuming the caller didn't call something an error. Assuming it didn't call something an error. So this doesn't indicate the dancers are weak, but it indicates the caller has not matched his or her calling with what the floor can handle. So this is important. So what are you calling and what can the floor handle? And you have to match those two together to make sure that you're not going to get the breakdowns out there on the floor. Okay? So those are some of the kind of big picture reasons why squares break down. Number two, what our role is. What our role is. As callers, we are ultimately responsible for the dancer's success or failure. Do you agree? Do you agree? Yes. Okay, got to get on tape there. So, <laughs> um, so, so we, we've talked about the issues about calling, uh, with the sound mixing, and of course we have the issues of whether we're calling too fast, uh, whether it's appropriate what we're calling. Um, Sometimes the dancers are just not prepared for what you're going to call. Okay, so if if that's the case, if you're calling something the dancers just simply cannot do what you're calling, you need to do something to prepare them for that. Okay, so prepare your dancers for the material that you're going to use. And what I mean by that is this: some people who know me that when I call, I call a little bit unusual things, and I know that dancers off the top may not be able to do them. So I might want to prepare them a little bit for what I'm going to call. I, I'll call something. A certain sequence, whatever it might be, but I'll tell the dancers oftentimes, this is what I'm going to call. I'm going to call it like this. I want you to do it, and here's how it's going to look. So prepare the dancers for that. And if you prepare them for that and you let them know whether it's a walkthrough or just simply calling and giving them some clue ahead of time, you're giving them a chance of success for that rather than calling out of the blue. Um, I give an example here in this handout here. When we have a squared set, there's many ways to start out from a squared set, right? Most common, head square through four hands, okay? We've done that 10 million times. So we think of other ways of doing things, heads right and left through, heads star through, heads flutter wheel, whatever it might be, right? And maybe, I don't know how you are, but maybe you think of, isn't there something else I can possibly do to make it interesting? And, and I think of that too. What else can I possibly do? At the same time you do that, though, you're also increasing the probability that your dancers are going to fail on what you're doing because they're not used to it. They're not ready for it. So uh, I'll remember this. I remember this story from. Uh, is Al Stevens in the room by any chance? Al Stevens is a great caller. He's from Germany, and they dance a little differently in Germany. They they dance they dance more uh, more robust basic program than we dance here. And at Nationals a few years ago, he was calling in the mainstream hall. And I love this story. He gets on stage and he starts out the sequence: head spin the top, turn through, slide through. Now, if you can visualize that at all, it's head spin the top, and after the turn through, they're in an eight chain through formation, then slide through. 20 squares on the floor, and every square fell apart, died. And so he got him back home, and he tried something else similar again, and they died. And he looked at me and said, what am I calling wrong? I said, nothing, Al. It's great material. It's just nobody can do it out there. And so so this is a great, I thought, this is really great. I'm going to write that one down. So I did write that one down. So I, I like that sequence, head spin the top, turn through, slide through. But I realized that if I called that to dancers, they're not going to be able to do that. They're just not going to do that. They're not going to do a spin the top from a facing couple. They're not going to do it from a squared set. They're just not going to do it. So you need to warm them up to that idea of how that's going to look. It's not that they can't do it. They're just not, they've never seen it before. Or most dancers haven't. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do something like that, I need to break down getting them to that position. So I, 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 I I wrote down here, how would, I, how would I get dancers warmed up to the idea of like head spin the top, turn through, slide through? Well, there's a lot of things going on there. There's a spin the top for facing couples. That's unusual. There's a spin the top of the boys on the end. That's unusual too, right? There's a spin the top from a squared set. That's unusual. There's a turn through not followed by an alaman left, right? Because normally we follow a prime. Not with a turn through that they're now meant just after anyway. So, yeah. so I mean, we always call it that way, right? So, what do we call after a turn through? Oftentimes, after a turn through, it's an alaman left. So, if this is something else, it's not an alaman left. So, there's a lot of things for the dancer to warm up to. Are you guys kind of following along with the whole process here? So, then the question becomes, how do you break down that that kind of without you don't want to make a workshop out of this? And you're at a dance, you're calling a dance somewhere. How do you break this down so your dancers can be successful in a way that they're ready for the material you're going to call? And it's something that's, you know, 
whatever it might be, something different and unusual. If it's, if it's normal to standard common material, they're probably going to do it unless they don't have the skill set. So I broke it down like this. Simply, so I'm going to find calls that end in a turn through to, to, to just get them used to the turn through, make sure they understand turn through. Do you remember turn through? Like, like do a sequence and swing through, turn through, Alaman left. You know, make sure they can do that stuff. If they can't do that, you need a warm up to that too. Um, try calling spin the top from right hand waves with the boys in the end instead of the boys in the middle, like they're always in the middle, right? So try to put them on the end a few times and get them used to that idea where the girls have to move up from the boys turn three quarter in the middle. That'll take a little while getting used to that. Um, call it from a, a tidal wave with the boys in each end. Call it from an eight shade through, okay? So you have that there. Finally, call the call from a squared set and get them through that followed by the turn through. And all these pieces will start to fall into place and then they'll execute the sequence that you want to do. I'm just taking a little kind of a microcosm of a sequence and trying to see how I break that down to get some success rate for the dancers that I'm calling to. So, so there's an example of how I'm preparing the dancers for the material that I want to present to them. I want to present something that's going to be there. Now, other times I may call a call, just a simple standard call, and we talk about this in one of the other sessions, I'll spin chain the gears. Now, if I just call spin chain the gears from a standard position, right hand wave, boys in the end, girls in the middle, what is the success rate? Anybody have any idea? Uh, on a regular plus floor, what's your success rate? 50%? 60%? 60 so, so that's, and that's, <laughs> I know she's laughing. Why? So, so what? No one uses it, okay. So, so there's an example of a call. They say, well, let's say you want to use spin chain the gear. It should be a normal call to use, right? Because it's on the program. Um, you would have to actually prepare the dancers for that. You might call it once, see what the success rate is, and then you might have to cue them through a few more times. And then hopefully they'll remember how to do the call and you'll continue using it. Um, if they don't, then if they can't do the call after that, then it goes right back to the dancer's skill issues. Do the dancers have the skill sets needed to attend this dance plus or, or, or mainstream or whatever level it might be, right? So you need to look at those things. And if you can prepare the dancers for the material that you're doing at the program that you're calling, then you're setting them up for success. If you cannot, if you can't prepare them for your material, then 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 you're going to have breakdowns in the square, and the people are going to look at you like you're crazy, and someone will get upset, and you don't understand why because you're calling really great stuff and nobody can do it, right? All right, so that's that's one one aspect of looking at this thing, preparing the dancers. Second, this one's more specific. Or move the dancers if you need to. And I do this with my classes that I have that I teach. Let's say you've got some brand new people in the, in the group that may be weak or, or whatever they might be, and you've got some angels and, and others in the club, and they're in a the square. How would you rearrange things to be more successful? I'm not going to put all my beginners in one square if I've got a lot of angels in the club, too. I'm going to kind of try to mix them around. If they gather in one area, I'm going to try to spread them across if I can, okay? I mean, we all do that. Do you all do that? You move, move your beginners around if, if you need to do that? Okay. Second, always move your class or new or weak dancers to the front of the hall. So if you talk to them on the break, talk to them on the break. First of all, talk to people. Make sure you go out and talk to people, especially the ones that really need to be connected, like the newer dancers, the weaker dancers, the, the beginners, whatever it might be. Talk to them so they feel at least somewhat happy about being there because maybe they're struggling, and then encourage them to dance in the front. Dance in front of you. If they're up there in front of you, two things are going to happen. One, they're going to be more tuned in, more sharp than like, like right there on whatever they could do is square dancing. And the second thing is you're going to be watching them. You're going to see them. You're going to see what they're going to do. You're going to see where their strengths and their weaknesses are, and more likely your calling is going to adapt to what they can and cannot do so you can help them. If they're in the back of the hall hiding out, because they all hide out in the back, right? They don't, they don't come up front. So if they're in the back hiding out, you're calling to all your great dancers up here, well, they're lost back there, and you're just bombing along with the, with the people up front. You don't want that. You want to bring them to the front so you can call more for them to see that they're going to be successful in what they're doing. The rest of the, the, rest of the floor is going to do fine. So really encourage them. Try to connect with those weaker dancers, the newer dancers, the beginners, whatever, so they can come up and, and be part of the square dancing with you. Now, talk to your angels. Talk to your angels ahead of time. Encourage them to mix around in the squares. Okay, so every tip, don't let them all stay together. Move them around. Make sure they make sure your club members go out there and mix with these people so they, they 
they, they, they got a good mix of every tip that you have some different people in different squares. And if they're not mixing naturally, do call some scatter promenades. Whatever is needed that it's going to take to get that mix to happen out there. So it's really important to talk to your angels and have them on board with all this thing. Dancer training. Train your dancers. Train your dancers well to avoid these structural breakdowns. What's the, what's the, um, what I'm going to put, put, the, put it out to you, and I'll yell it out and I'll just repeat it in the microphone. What are the most common errors you see dancers make that cause them to break down? Like a newer dancer class, say a mainstream class, you know, zero to, zero to 68. Any, any ideas? What, what are some errors in the dancing styles you see that, that cause people to break down and squares to fall apart? What? Not taking hands. Not taking Squares too big. Not knowing the rights and lefts. <laughs> That's not a very good one, yeah. Not properly finishing the previous call, okay. Lack of positional awareness. Those are all good things. And so so these are things you've got to teach your dancers. Um, uh, in, in a very basic level, in the, in the very beginning, I always tell dancers when we do a beginning of a, a singing call, in a beginner class, uh, you can forget everything about anything about square dancing, but boys, do not forget where home is. Because when you promenade, I at least want you to go back to home. So how many times they keep promenading forever and they don't even know where they're going? So you can forget everything, but at least promenade home and we can start over again, right? But the next level up becomes you can forget how to do the call or whatever we're doing or trying to teach, but at least let's get some skills in here so we have some uh, kind of a fighting chance to try to get there. And one of them can be, of course, making that hand contact. You've got to make that hand contact and touch so you know where you are, and you set positional awareness. So the two kind of go hand in hand, no pun intended. But it's, it's just that. It's, if you can't get those dancers to, to connect up in a way that they see their formation, then it's going to be very, it's going to be very hard for them to be successful in the next parts of the sequences. How many people do you know hedge their bet? Like they'll do something like cast off three quarters, something like that, and they'll just kind of, or trade, and they'll go like, they'll do a half turn and maybe an eighth more, or like a sixteenth more, or something like that. They're kind of like, hmm? yeah, like that. They're kind of like on the diagonal, and so the, like as Betsy's demonstrating here, she's like, uh, I'll do this way, and I'll keep both hands out in case somebody wants to grab me either way. You know, I'll just do that, yeah. And then, then I'll go, then I'll do something else, and I'll just keep kind of turning. It's I always, you know, when you when you when you do a call, you know the call ends, and you're supposed to stop, right? To, you know, if you know where the call happens. How many people do a call, and you see the dancer do the call, and then they stop? No, they don't really stop. They kind of slow down. They just kind of keep coasting and coasting and coasting. It's like in baseball when you get that uh, first base hit. You get to overrun first base. That's okay. It's allowed. It's not allowed for second, third, and home. You've got to actually stop there, right? So, so it's not baseball. You have to actually stop when the call is over. And so many dancers kind of like keep wandering around, and they're kind of looking around. They don't know what's happening, but they don't stop, and they don't connect up with the handholds. So, so that's one thing. The other thing you've got to have dancers do is commit. And what I'm saying by commit is when they execute a call, don't start to maybe do something and just move and see if somebody's going to direct them in some position or, or take you somewhere. They've got to commit into doing something. When I, was in, when I was in chorus class back in college a million years ago, I was in there and, and uh, we were, you know, whatever it was, second alto or whatever, we were singing some song, and I don't know what we were singing, but we the the... Uh, I guess our section was kind of soft. It wasn't very loud. <laughs> I don't remember why. It was a complicated song. And the teacher, right, the chorus teacher, came over and said to us, I want to hear you guys. He's, we're going through the song. I want to hear you. And he said, I want you guys to sing this thing. Sing it out loud. Because, I always remember this, because if it's right, we need to hear it. And if it's wrong, we need to fix it. So he wanted us to commit. He wants to just sing it. Whatever it might be, right or wrong, just sing it. Because if it's wrong, we'll fix it. And if it's right, well, that's what we need to do, right? So the same thing is with the beginners. How many of them don't commit? They just kind of well, you know, float around here or float around a little bit there, and maybe I'll get somewhere. Well, you, what you want to get them to do is to commit saying, well, do something, whatever you think that call might be, and do it. Just do the call. And, and if it's right, great. If it's not, well, then we got something we can fix. We can, we can correct that, whatever it might be. Go through the training to fix that call. So... We, 
I understand why, dan- why dancers will be hesitant in doing a call because they're not sure. So you need to address that issue about why they're not sure. But get them to get some kind of certainty about something, whether it's right or wrong, so they'll do something, and then you can go forward from there. So that's about the, about the commitment. You've got to get the dancers to commit to what they're doing. So we're talking about the new dancers here. Finally, walkthroughs. Do not be afraid of doing walkthroughs. I do walkthroughs all the time with my new dancer classes. Um, I do them before the class starts. They love them. They're more intimate. We go in the side room before the actual class starts, and we get kind of a group together, and we can, they can they talk to me because, oh, it's more personable, one-on-one. We can talk. We can answer questions about how to do a call. Um, they love that. They love doing stuff like that. Um, and don't be afraid to have other dancers show your beginners how to do something, even if it's not the words you would use to do it. I've learned that you know I can give all the correct words in the world how to do a call, and still somebody's not going to get it or may not really fully understand it. But another dancer will say, here, just do this and this and this, and they'll get that. I don't have to worry that it's not absolutely perfect because, you know, eventually we'll get to the point where we can work out the details in the call. But I need them to get through that call and get something going there. So so those are some of the things about the dancer training I wanted to talk about and about how to mix up the square. So handling those structural breakdowns along that line is is doing some preparation and getting your dancers ready if you're in a class situation. If you're calling a dance, an open dance for other people, it's about preparing them for the material you're about to call and to actually get them through that material. Um, Finally, what about ways to have the squares recover during a tip? We always talk about that. How do you guys do that? When you have a a square, when you have a square breakdown, what do you you guys say? Anything. Just call it out. Lines. You just say lines? Okay. Regular lines. Anything else? What? You teach the dancers about symmetry in a class? Checkpoint. So when you're teaching a class, you talk about your opposite and who they are and the symmetry in that. Okay? Okay, hang on. Caller Lab has a recommended broken square recovery. I'm going to bring the microphone over here. Warren Gaskell, Bellingham, Washington. Caller Lab has a recommended broken square recovery, and I teach that in the class. And I got to tell you that my dancers really appreciate that because not every club does that. You want to tell us how it works? Yeah. Okay. The process is everybody gets home. Head couples slide to the right, make lines with the sides. That's exactly right. Slide right to a line. Everybody, anybody ever heard that term? So I think actually Lee Cobb uses it more of his calls. <laughs> Heads slide right to a line. Get them into a zero line fast. Um, so that's that's a quick way to do things. So if you so you have two options. One is get them into those lines like that as quickly as possible and train your dancers to do that. Or make your sequences short. If your square starts apart, it's time to end the sequence. Get Find an element left, get back home, and you start over again with something else and go back to where the part that happened. Yeah. One, long time ago, I had just taught a cl- class at our club, and I didn't teach them to make lines. So we had about, you know, graduation dance, we had about six, seven squares on the floor, and of course all the newbies were clustered, not quite in the back, but towards the middle in one square, or a lot of them, and that square was fumbling. And I said, make lines of four, go forward and back, and six squares went forward and back, and the other square scrambled around doing nothing, not making lines, because they didn't know how. Whose fault was that? And I said, make lines of four, go forward and back. And six squares went forward and back. And now they're getting a little ticked off with me and the people who didn't make lines, but it was my fault they didn't know how. Okay. Eric started and he was working on classes and he was talking about different things. I made some notes because I wanted to chime in on things he said. He said, on a bad sounding hall, you know, lower your music. The other thing to consider in a hall that has a lot of echoes is pick your music and be careful of the instrumentation. There are certain things that will reverberate more than others. I know also that I like a banjo lead. 
However, a banjo lead and my voice blend really nicely. So especially if I'm in a bad hall, there are no banjo leads in my music that night. And it makes a difference. Um, if you have something that's a really bright and bouncy tune with a lot of melody in a reverberating hall, it will not be, it, you know, you can turn it almost off and it still will not help. So be aware of the instrumentation of your music when the, hall, when the sound is bad. Uh, one of the other things Eric was talking about in class is move the, you know, the, the squares so they're evenly balanced and you have some stronger dancers and some weaker dancers. If you're at a dance and you can't necessarily do that, maybe you're doing a, a guest tip at a dance or you're calling for a club you don't normally call for, you don't have the license at that point in my mind to move, say, Eric, would you and Jennifer go to that square and bring the, send that couple over there? I'm never going to see that club again. But what I can do is move the dancers within the square so that the new couple is not always with their partner. I've, you know, ladies circulate, take them to another person, then do, do something and move them away from each other so they're not even in the same side of the square. Do you understand what I'm, I'm talking about? Basically, I remember going to a dance. We had a brand new couple. They were petrified and not functioning well. And the caller kept doing things with all them and another weaker couple, all in the same ocean wave. So the one side of the square was great, the other side of the square was in total disarray. All, to my mind, all that caller had to do was say, from the parallel waves, the boys circulate and the girls circulate, you've moved the strong, two of the stronger dancers into the weak wave and then everything was more equal instead of keeping the partners together. So be aware of that. You can maneuver the dancers to strengthen the individual square. Sure. If you have the opportunity to, if, like you say, you can't do this for an open dance, but for your own classes or workshops, if you have an opportunity to arrange couples that you know are weak and strong in a square, how do you arrange them? Do you know? You always put them opposite each other. Never put them next to each other, right? Do you all understand what I'm saying? If you have two, a pair of weak couples or new dancer couples or whatever, never put them next to each other because statistically they will be interacting with each other a whole lot more than they will be with their opposite. With you rarely, you, 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 you interact with your opposite a, far lot, a lot less than you do with your side couples on either side of you. So put your weaker couples opposite each other. That way they'll be dancing with the stronger couples on either side of them for most of the sequence. And, and to add to that, if you have, this, say, the sides of the stronger set of couples, start first a few times with the sides. Move them out to the heads. Because sometimes in that square where you have the weaker head couples, you start with the heads. They never get past the first two calls of choreography to get to the stronger dancers. So start with your stronger dancers for a while. This takes a little awareness, but it will help. And then you can have the... the Less proficient dancers do something easy to get them going, like head slide or slide through, because I'm using the condensed teaching order rather than star through, but slide through or star through, pass through, and that'll pretty well get them over to the people you need them to be with for what you're doing. So you can maneuver the dancers to optimize the square. Uh, okay. As you call, especially if you're teaching, emphasize what the positions are. If the dancers don't know why a right-hand wave is called a right-hand wave and what constitutes a right-handed wave, how can they make one if you say make a right-hand wave or you're supposed to have a right-hand wave? If they don't know what the goal is, you, they can't create it for you. So that's an important, important thing to me. Um, stress, stress the ending positions. This call starts here and finishes here. And this is a right-handed wave, blah, 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 with the boys facing in and the girls facing out. And let them know that. Uh, okay. All right, Eric was talking about people who didn't perform the call or they hedged their bets. There was one more thing that I thought about, which is the ones that are doing it correctly. 
but they lack confidence so much. They're driving, you know, analogy. You're driving down the interstate, the speed limit is 70, and these people are doing 52. It's going to create an accident anyway. In the left lane. In the left lane. Yes. Oh. But, but the point is, they can be doing it correctly, but if they're doing it so slowly that they don't get there in time, some other dancer will be going, well, there's nobody here, I'll just do something else or wander off. So emphasize, if you're going to do something, be bold about it. If you're going to mess up, mess up boldly. That's, it's better to mess up boldly than it is to do the correct thing so slowly that nobody else is going to be able to dance with you. Commit. Commit. Exactly. And if you make it funny like that, they'll, they'll take it in good humor. And as, as they said, teach how to make lines. So those are some of the things that Eric's talking alerted me to. Now, he was talking mainly about classes. And I'm dealing more with calling at different clubs. So you call it your home club. You know the strengths and weaknesses of the dancers, and you can start preparing them and work around that. But if you go out to a club that you don't call for more than once a year or you've never called for, then you have to assess the floor and figure out how to make them successful. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't necessarily want to call vanilla all night long. I might want to get to vanilla fudge. Maybe I'm not getting to tutti frutti, but I want to get to something more than that. Yeah. Uh, you, Eric, you want to oh, yeah. run the mic for me? Thanks. Alan Hurst, Sunnyvale, California. I ask every more experienced caller I meet the same question because it's always a different answer. It's always fascinating. How do you assess the floor? I start with something. Oops. I start with something standard, and then at certain at different programs, there are different calls that I believe are less used. I know what's used in my area. So if I'm calling, I'm, I'm from New Jersey, I call in New York State, Pennsylvania, Delaware, the surrounding areas to New Jersey, and I know what calls are neglected. And we do have some mainstream clubs. So if I'm going to a mainstream dance, I know that, um, say, walk and dodge is less used. I know that box and at is less used. I know that, uh, what else? Oh, turn through is not used often. So I'm going to throw in, do paso without queuing. I'm going to throw in the one or two of the calls that I'm pretty sure are not used often and see if they perform them. And, and also, and I quote John Colton Fuller on this all the time, it's funny because it's true. You start off and you call, see how well the dancers are, have been programmed by their previous caller. You start off and you say, head square through four, swing through, and then go. <clears throat> and, you, and then you look to see if they did a spin the top or a boy's run. And it's funny because it's true, and that's sad. But if you know that, then you can use that to know what the dancers are going to be doing. Spin chain the gears is one that you can use at plus. Because nobody does spin chain the gears. It has to be an exchange. Follow your neighbor without a spread is one that I can use. Chase right, I believe, is a lesser, lesser used call. Any of those, if I throw them in and see what happens. Call lead right and see how quickly they circle to a line without you saying it. And call something else after lead right. I took down a floor recently. I wasn't intending to. But I just had the idea of reviving directionally the call circle to a two-faced line, which was, call. it's a wonderful call. You know call. And I don't need it. Circle to a two-faced line. And I don't need to call it anymore. What I called for the, the group was heads lead right, circle left halfway, and veer left. And the circle left halfway and veer left is circle to a two-faced line. They circled to a line without me ever saying anything about to align. All I said was circle left halfway. They were well programmed. And so, 
So I call. I said, "Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't call that right." Okay. Heads lead right. Join hands. Make a circle. Circle left exactly halfway. Veer left. And then I went on calling. And the next time I used lead right and circle left halfway, there was a whole lot more success. But I didn't tell them they goofed horribly. I told them I didn't call it well, because I needed to make the whole point that it's not always circle to a line. And circle to a line is is pre-programmed after lead right. So now is veer left. So the question then is, what else can I do to make it a little different without having them wander too far away? Now, one of the things I find in my area is that a lot of dancers are not used to um, smooth flowing choreography without coming to a stop. It's unfortunately, it's unfortunate, but a lot of callers let all the dancers complete the call and then call the next call. Consequently, if I'm calling something that's moving along nicely, they're not. Uh, they think I'm way too fast and they have no idea what to do. And part of that is the connectivity that we talked about. They don't take hands automatically. I had a caller in my area at the Callers Association in a discussion, and he said, well, I can't get my dancers to take hands. And I said, I nag. Now, I nag in a certain way. It's heads, say, head square through four, swing through, do a single hinge, centers trade, split circulate, centers trade, single hinge, centers trade, centers run, centers trade. Every time I call centers trade, it forces them to reach out and touch. After a while, they're going to get in the habit, at least for me. They may not do it to the next caller, but I have politely coerced them into doing it my way. Uh, lines of four, I have more trouble getting the, the dancers in the center to connect. They always want to play patty cake. But if you have a, a dancers in a standard line, pass through, tag the line, face in, pass through, centers California twirl, and the ends do a U-turn back. You've changed your, form, your arrangement but also you force the centers to take hands in the center of that line. And maybe they'll get the idea. So there are ways in your choreography to help the dancers to kind of be more successful with what you want to do. Add something in there a little, remind me of something. One of the um, uh, mantras I give to my dancers is that uh, uh, basically I want them to dance. Who said big squares are a problem? You said over big square, yeah. Susan. So that, so that, obviously the 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 uh, the cor corollary to that is small squares are better, right? So keep your square tight. So you want to keep your square tight. Um, and I and I and I really I give the mantra to my dancers: a a, a tight square is a good square. I mean, keep your square as tight as possible. They hear me say that. Keep your square tight. And at that point, they start to shrink back together. There are certain calls that expand squares. Mm -hmm. uh, an advanced cast of shadow is a square expanding call. And good dancers, if they get uh, the second or two, will collapse as a square back together. Tag the line she just mentioned is a square expanding call. When you do the call, tag the line, dancers are naturally far apart. If there's any pause at all, those dancers should collapse back together quickly. And so it goes back to that adage of keep your square tight. Um, so it goes back to the training issue. And, and what she's kind of saying there, she's breaking up the pattern, but she's also making sure the squares are tight. You want to keep the squares tight, make the handhold, make the connection. We're holding hands. Um, so that we, we're ready for anything. Let's see, I'm ready for anything. We can do it. All okay. Right. Yeah. The other thing you can do with that is when you're teaching. When I'm teaching, I'm, I talk to the students about um, square breathing, which is what Eric's talking about. Keep the square tight. We all breathe. We, uh, the, you know, the lungs expand and then they contract. If the lungs continue to expand to a certain extent, you're going to be very uncomfortable and possibly pass out or something. And if you contract them, yeah, stay up. But the, 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 it makes a point to the dancers, and I say, now you, okay, at Mainstream or Plus, if you have called from, from a, um, a corner box, swing through, spin the top, 
You've expanded your square in one direction, eight people long. It's only one person wide. If you call a hinge, there will be a space between each and every mini wave that has to be contracted to actually make the column exist. And you point that out to the dancers so that they understand, I got to move closer. Okay. So it's, it's, you can also help train for that. Um, so w you're going to clubs in your area or even out of your area, but it's better in your area. You need to be aware of the standard uses for most calls, how to create variations that will c help enable the dancers to succeed. If you're going to start with what Eric quoted about Al with the head spin the top, we know that the spin the top starts with the boys in the center and the girls on the end so the boys can move up, blah, blah, blah. That's standard. How would you vary that so that you you don't panic them? Um, I would set them up in boy, boy, girl, girl waves because you call the spin the top. You have half of the dancers are in the familiar positions, half of them are not, and you can say, and now we have the boys together and the girls together again because you get back to the same person on spin the top. So I have a known ending. I can help cue the ending, I, and I've moved four of the dancers, two in each wave, out of their comfort zone. But I've given them a supporting group, the four that have the standard set up, to help them cr create what I need. So whenever I'm varying the arrangement for a call, I move only four dancers out of their comfort zone in the arrangement until I can move to everybody starting to spin the top from the, a different, totally different arrangement. So he's, she's got a good point there. Um, two, two things I want to say. One, unrelated. He, I was wrong. It was not Al Stevens. It was Walt Burr. Walt Burr is a great okay. caller. Yes. He, was, he came from Germany doing this. Um, it was not Al Stevens. But second, here's a good example. Um, uh, recycle. How do we do recycle? Does anybody, how, how do we do recycle? Parallel right-handed waves with the boys on the end and, and the girls and the, boy, and the, the boys. What are the boys just turn the girls around, do a wheel and deal, right? That's how the call is done, right? No. Well, that's how they dance it. Haven't you seen that video on YouTube? Never mind. Um, so no. So the, 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 I'm joking, of course. The the call recycle when you do it with the boys in the middle and the girls in the end. You already know what kind of success rate you might get for an open dance, right? Maybe not so great. Right. The next so, call is square up. Yeah, next call. So, so how could you lead them into that material if you want to use that at open dance? And I do that at open dances, by the way, all the time. I, I will have a recycle with the boys in the middle and the girls in the end, but I know the floor won't be able to do it originally. initially. I'll usually set up a wave of four dancers in the middle, like, you know, some wheel and deal and spread or whatever, and get the four girls in the middle, four boys and the boys on the outside, a quarter tag, right? Girls swing through, girls recycle. Two girls will have no problem at all, and two girls might be confused. But usually the girls that have no problem at all will guide the other two girls unless they're stronger. Um, and they'll go through that a few times. And then we'll have the boys do that. So now I've got the boys doing the same thing, and they're going to do it a few times. Into they're gonna, at first, you can look at the faces. This is really strange. I've never done this before, but they'll kind of go with it because they kind of have to. But they'll get used to it after a while. So she's saying we have two people who know what they're doing and two people that are new for them and eventually they're going to get used to the flow. And that's a good way, if you're workshopping it, that's a great way to workshop it also. Uh, but if I were going to workshop recycle with out of standard positions, I would probably do a lot of work on the ends cross fold before I did anything with recycle. Because the end, part of the problem is the end dancers don't know how far they, they go if they've never done it before. So if you teach them how far they go, you allow them to map quest the ending position, and so they kind of have the route from, the, from going on the map quest. And I've used that analogy, and it makes everybody chuckle a little so they know what's going on. Well, if you can make it fun in some way, you get them relaxed. Relaxed dancers will dance better. If you can make them enjoy it, you can possibly politely impose your will upon them, and they will still succeed. Uh, we callers need to know, oh yeah, quick hints about the ending position. You know, all four girls are in the center. Starting double pass through, 
four girls are in the center. Now, before I say that, if I have a, a girl who has wandered and somewhere is on the outside, what my goal is, is I'll have the center four pass through and turn around and put the the lone boy that's in the center near the girl that's on the outside. I'll put him on the same side of the square. Can they just fix it then? Can they yes. Just the and then, then I'll say, oh, I'd really like to see four girls in the middle. And since they're really close, they can make the adjustment. And I have helped them to fix whatever happened. Because I'm, uh, you know, I can be aware of that, and I haven't messed up any other square because they already had four girls in the middle, and it didn't matter to them if they did a pass through and a U turn back in the center. I just made sure I made the adjustment and the fix quick. Um, okay, so I, helper words are uh, it's what I'm going to. I, you know, I, I'll give ending positions, hints, whatever, to try and help them achieve it. And if they fix it, I'll go, you know, there's extra, there's extra credit for making recoveries. Recoveries count extra credit. Yeah. Caller, we callers need to be aware of how helper words can um, mislead the dancers into thinking wrong, wrongly about the call. One of the most common that I found, in, at least in our area, is a center zoom. Now, if the centers zoom, the ends haven't done anything, and there's a big gap in the square. And at Mainstream, I'm not about to put that big gap in the square and invent the phantoms who snuck in and, and do triple boxes. So I need to alert the squares that it's the centers are going back and the ends are going forward, and the call is zoom. I figured this out one time because I was calling at a club, and I said, everybody zoom. They tried to do it twice. They had no clue that the ends, it was a leader trailer call, and that the ends going, f outsides going forward was part of the call. It opened my eyes. Um, so I also call a, a variation there where I'll have, say, Standard couples starting double pass through position, I'll call just the girls zoom. And they'll, they'll try and look around to see where the other girl is because they figure all the girls have to be in the center. And, and I'm like, both of them go back, right? yeah, nope. So I've seen that. Yes, both of them go back. But I'll go, the lead girl goes back, the trailing girl goes forward. Boys coach. Because then the boy can reach out and take somebody's hand and help her and guide her a little bit. And the trailing girl who wants to go back, said, please don't leave the square. Please come yeah. back. Uh, so, I, you know, that's a place to vary Zoom. Eric already said it. Keep the, keep the um, sequences short. Oh, I know the other, the other misleading thing that we use for odd infinitum, and that's take a peek. And I truly believe now that on most floors, I can call, take a peek, and never actually say the name of the call, and they'll do the trade the wave. But if I call trade the wave without saying take a peek, they don't do it. So I stopped about four or five years ago. I stopped saying take a peek because I want the dancers to know the name of the call, which is trade the wave. So I'll, I'll, I'll make a joke out of it if I can and say, trade the wave, peek if you want. But we're adding take a peek as a new call on the plus list. So look for that coming up next. Uh-huh. And what's the action going to be? Yeah, I see a, a couple hands. Uh, can you run a mic for me? You're younger. Gary Felton, Maryland. I've taken a different track with Take a Peek. I will have a um, left hand ocean weight, Take a Peek, and the boy cross run. Take a Peek in the center's trade. And try to get them the idea that Take a Peek's not in pen, in t important anymore. Okay. Hi, Mike Callahan from New York. A lot of times when you teach begin Whoop, there you go. You can say, tell them where they're going to end up, and then do your teach. You square through, have them go in face or corner, say, now this is where you're going to end up. Don't forget that. And then you can proceed with your teach. If you're going to have the heads lead right and circle to a line, have the heads slide over, make the line of four, and think, this is where you're going to end up, 
and then proceed with your teach. Yeah. If you're going to teach flutter wheel, how many have seen the guys try to courtesy turn the girl every time you teach it? Have the men cross over and say, man, this is where you're going to end up when we do this, and then proceed with your teach. Or even eight chain through, which is, is really a bear for a lot of uh, new dancers. Have them go and face their corner, see who you're next to, see who you're facing. This is where you're going to end up. Don't forget that. And then proceed with your teach. Turn through. Heads turn through. Say, be, before you do it, have the heads do a U-turn back. And say, now you're going to end up back to back right here. And then proceed with your teach. So a lot of these calls, you can have them see where they're going to end up first and then do the teach part of it. Yeah. I especially <laughs> use that also on recycle. If, if I'm doing recycle, I, I map quest the ending before they go so that, you know, I'll have the, the boys cross fold, the girls step back from the standard position. I say, now, girls, that's not how you're going to get here, but this is where you're looking for. Now, blah, 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 and on to the teach. So, yes, I, I quite agree. I think that's a great thing to make sure that you know. Now, if you're dancing at a club and you know there's a, there's a nice ending where the – Boys are in the middle, the girls are on the end, and you set it up so that you can recycle to a right and left grant. That's a great ending if the dancers can recycle from that wave, but that's not standard. So you're going to get a lot of failure. Why do you want to do something that creates failure? I personally call more often than not the girls cross fold, shake hands in a right and left grant. Alan, did, did you want to make a comment? Alan Hurst, Sunnyvale, California. I call for a lot of gay clubs which dance APD and DBD. And a cue I learned from before when you have girls on the end for a recycle is be assertive, girls. Yes, I actually, I actually tell them they need to be politely assertive. Because, because some people could be more assertive than others. Now, I want to talk also about singing calls. Singing calls, are, to my mind, are very important. When I'm teaching lessons, I use singing calls throughout the night. Uh, when I do dances, you know, I do a mainstream and plus, I'm going to use singing calls. Back in the 60s, we all walked through the figure of the singing call before we danced it. And, you know, no matter what, it was, it was standard operating procedure that we did the figure of the singing call back in the 60s. So these days, I don't do that, but I will... I will use the pattern within my pattern. I will also, I choose to theme around a couple of calls on, on different tips. So I want to use a singing call that uses the calls I've themed. Now, if my theme call I decided in advance is spin chain the gears and they don't do it in the pattern, I'm changing the theme for the singing call. But otherwise, I will dance the, the, the theme calls in the patter, and then at least once or twice, I'll throw in the actual singing call figure and then get them back out to an Alaman left or a Graham right and left before I call it in the singing call. They won't actually recognize it, but they'll be more comfortable. So if I can set them up to be comfortable, because singing calls are hard. If you do a properly timed singing call, and you have dancers that are uncertain or newer, they're going to fail because they have a couple of extra beat reaction times for different figures that will make the properly timed singing call figure all of a sudden, instead of being 64 beats, it'll turn out to be 68 or 70 beats, and they're now behind. The rest of the squares are fine. Uh, another way to do that is to throw in something in your choreography that is... Um, a zero at the end so you can eliminate that the first time through the singing call. And then when they get, so you look around and the whole floor is now ahead of you, you add the zero back in. Beware though, if you're teaching, make sure that the zero is something they've already had. I, I've heard, heard the story, there, I think it might have been John Kaltenfeller again, but they were, he was doing something and he at, needed to add some more calls and he thought he was going to touch a quarter and scoot back. They hadn't had scoot back. So all of a sudden he got touch a quarter, everybody fold and swing, which is a big surprise and everybody looks at you funny and it can be, it, it can be great to use. But he had to figure out what to do. Another way to do that if they don't know scoot back is touch a quarter, centers trade twice. They may throw things, but 
you haven't caused them to fail. But you have to use your brain quickly. Um, I just did a dance in February up in northern, northern New York State, and they had just graduated 24 dancers in their mainstream. And they told me, you know, all our dancers are coming tonight. And the first singing call I did, the choreography was probably as boring as you can make it. The music was snappy, and the dancers succeeded, and that's all they needed. They set, I set them up to make them feel really good about themselves. I'll tell you what, the song was uh, Hit Me With Your Best Shot, which is a nice snappy piece of music. The figure was head square through four, slide through, pass through, bend the line, go forward and back, slide through. That's not a properly timed singing call figure, but they needed that time to, in order to respond to a new caller and, and with snappier music than they might be used to, and they all were like high as kites because they succeeded. That's part of what we need to do is figure out how to set them up to succeed. Um, callers, you know, Eric talked about the, the newbies are all gathered in the back, cowering in fear, and you're calling along to the front squares, um, cooking, and they're just squaring up after three calls. Callers need to be watching the whole floor instead of your pilot square. Uh, we know they congregate in the back of the room. So basically what I try and do is I'll jot down a couple of site, you know, of site squares, because I site resolve most of the time, and I will trust them to do what I said. Sometimes I'm wrong. But I'll trust them to do what I said, and I will call to the groups in the back of the room, maybe giving them an extra beat, maybe giving them an extra hint until I need to resolve. Then I'll go back to my pilot squares and see if I can ascertain if there's symmetry. And if there's symmetry, I'm golden. And I can, I can resolve the square, and everybody else will come out fine. But if I just focus on those squares, I'm going to leave people in the back of the room in the dust. It also gave me a reputation for seeing everything. Because if you scan the whole floor, if the dancers are going to be fumbling in one square, if the dancers are all moving together, there's a pattern, and the pattern is smooth, and it's flowing. And if somebody starts to make some mistake, there's a break in the pattern, and it will draw your eye immediately, and maybe you can give helper words in time to get those dancers to uh, be able to succeed. I also have tricks. i, I got to ask a question about that. Yeah. How many of you have had that experience where you have a big floor out there, and the, whatever you're calling, and some dancer makes a mistake way in the corner somewhere, and you, you, know, you fix them or whatever, like they come up afterwards and say, that's amazing. How can you tell on all these dancers? How did you know I made a mistake? Has anybody ever had that come up? And I, I'm always amazed. Dance. I, how could you see me after all these dancers? I made the mistake up there. And it's just what Betsy says. It's very clear. Wait, Everybody's moving this way, and you're moving that way. You know? So you stick yeah. out. One of, the, one of the things I've found is that if, if you have um, a an arrangement which is non-symmetrical that you did not create intentionally. If you're, if you're lucky, say, say one wave, you have parallel right-handed waves, one wave has all the boys facing out and the girls facing in. No, one wave is the girls in the center and boys on the end. The other one is, is couple, the boy, boy, girl, girl. If you can call the center's trade and one gender or another you turn back, you have normalized the arrangement. Now, at that point, you have a bend. The li you have a line of four facing in or out in one one line, and a two-faced line in the other. And the call bend the line is wonderful. So I've developed ways that sometimes I can fix the squares without messing up anybody else. That's something for you to practice on your own, because I don't think I can teach it in. in the time we have left, we're prob probably, yeah, we're getting close to the end, if not at the end. Does anyone have any questions before we wrap this up and hand out the, give the handouts? I see Steve in the back. Steve, you have a question. What? Well, 
Steve Green from Monroe, North Carolina, or Mr. Patty Green. Uh, just a couple comments. You had uh, uh, the statement on making lines on breaking squares, uh, the importance of teaching the proper method of doing it, but not necessarily. You just, I mean, the, it's square dancing, not square standing. Mm -hmm. So if we get back to lines, the quicker we get back to dancing based on the statistics of being in lines. The other uh, question or assist I would like is on people that um, don't aren't rhythmic. So they can't pick up on the beat of music. They don't move to the beat of the music. What do you do with that? I I try and drive that with the the you know picking music that the beat is really strong you know is strong. If they aren't rhythmic, to be honest, I can't necessarily fix it. I'm not going to lecture, and I'm going to look at another square. Way back when I just when when Roy, my husband Roy came into our club, which uh, um, was a college age group at that point. He came in because his girlfriend, then fiance, wanted him to square dance. He hated it. He he dropped out. He came back. In the meantime, the next semester, she came back with her new boyfriend. Now, all three of them were in the same high school. All three of them were in the marching band, which was a prize-winning marching band. And the new boyfriend, Chuck, walked between the beats. It was his protest. He didn't want to be there. I looked at other people. I ignored him because I, otherwise it's going to irritate me to death. And if somebody doesn't have rhythm, but they're walking, you know, and, you know I'm just not going to fix it. I'm going to try and not let it bother me. I, I only brought that up because we have uh, a person in our club that is, is like that. I mean, he moves like half speed. So the timing can get way off. <clears throat> and uh, I, my only recollection of being able to assist that was when we first started dancing, he had us go in a, in a big circle and just walk to the beat of the music. Yeah, you can do that. But now the question is, why is this time person moving slowly? Is it because they're not rhythmic or is it because they, they don't have the same stride as somebody else? Or, you know, the question is, are, are there, is it, could there be some neuropathy so they're not really feeling their feet? So if I take like a, a two-foot stride, they may take a one-foot stride. So you, that, that may be part of it. One of the things that I would do to help them, I need to wrap it up, yes, but like I would put them on the inside when there are longer things on the outside. In other words, if you're calling plus, that person would be primarily on the inside for load the boat. Sounds funny, but it'll help, and they'll succeed. And if they succeed, maybe they'll get bolder in their stride. Okay, so we have handouts in the front there, up there. Betsy and I each have handouts for today's presentation. Thank you all for coming out this morning. It is now the lunch hour.